Welcome everyone. My name is Betsy O'Hagan and I'm here as host of some wonderful programs, wildlife programs being presented by Lake Erie Nature and Science Center on Mondays at noon EST during the month of February. So here we are today and I'd like to um, welcome you and um, the programs will be presented with Wildlife Program Specialist Christine Barnett and Wildlife Rehabilitation Specialist Tim Jasinski. Now these programs are very special. They're on Mondays, February 1st, 8, 15, and 22nd, as I mentioned, at noon EST. Uh, we'll all meet up at the WCAS Virtual Conference Center, the link that you see on your screen now. And please uh, feel free to visit either and both websites of Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society and Lake Erie Nature and Science Center. You'll see the website links at the bottom of the screen. Now, Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society is a chapter of the National Audubon Society and is based in the greater Cleveland, Ohio, U.S. area. Uh, we're going to move on. I'm going to go to our next slide and introduce you to our two presenters. On the left, Tim Jasinski, and on the right, Christine Barnett. But before we begin our live broadcast today, I want to talk with you about why it's so important to donate and support this wonderful center. Here, the picture that you can see on your screen now is with a group of birders visiting Lake Erie Nature and Science Center, which abuts the Huntington Res uh, Preserve and Reserve, a part of the Cleveland Metro Parks on the west side of Cleveland. Here is the center on the left in springtime. The middle photo, you'll see the beautiful sunlit corridor, main corridor in the building, and the various youth volunteers helping out and learning about animals, animal care, wildlife, and how we need to engage and respect wildlife in our urban areas. Now, as I said, I wanted to speak with you about donating. It's very, very important that we support these fine centers that are at various community locations wherever you are, whether it's on the west side of Cleveland or in another state or in another location of the world. But for Lake Erie Nature and Science Center uh, is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And here I've uh, uh, detailed the tax ID and a link where you could go and donate directly to the center. Uh, you would go to the, uh, also you can go to the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center Facebook page and look there for the donate button right on the home page. And you can make a donation there as well. Or if you would like to mail a check, you can mail a check to the address at number three on the current slide. You would mail it to Lake Erie Nature and Science Center, Attention Wildlife Rehabilitation Staff, 28728 Wolf Road in Bay Village, Ohio, 44140. And of course, you can always go to uh, the WC Audubon, that's WCAUDUBON.org website and go and either search there or on the home page is a navigational button uh, which you will take you to our article, Make a Donation to Lake Erie Nature and Science Center. Uh, and that is a great thing to do to help our important centers that provide essential services for wildlife as humans and wildlife interact in our more populated regions as well as our rural areas. I'm going to go on. So let me shift our screens now. And today's program is making lifelong connections with wildlife. 
So today, uh, our presenters are going to take you and help us take an up-close look at some of our animal ambassadors at the center and learn about the important connection between the center's animals and visitors. And stories will be shared, and, and I understand live wildlife will be seen. So let us move over to the center and we'll do a little bit of screen swapping here. And have everyone, hang on just a moment. All right then, here we are. So Christine, Please take it away. Excellent. Um, well, thank you for joining us and for uh, your interest in the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we are located, uh, as Betsy said, on the Huntington Reservation, which is part of the Cleveland Metro Parks. But Lake Erie Nature and Science Center is actually not a part of the Metro Parks. We're just lucky enough to be located on their property. We're actually a private nonprofit, which uh, means that we get to do a few things that you might not see somewhere else in the Metro Parks. For example, here at Lake Erie Nature and Science Center, we have uh, one of only two public planetariums up in Northeast Ohio. So that's one thing that's really special you're going to find here at our center that you won't find at the other nature centers. Um, the other thing that we do that's a little bit special is something called wildlife rehabilitation. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in just a few minutes. Um, but what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit more about our center and how it got started. Uh, our center last year celebrated the 75th anniversary. And the center was actually started uh, by Alberta Fleming. So she was really interested in wildlife and conservation. And she started uh, keeping animals in her own home. She'd have some of the neighborhood uh, students be able to come over to her home to interact and learn about those animals. And she would even take groups of children on uh, different field trips to go out and do water uh, quality sampling and teach them about wildlife as well as how to handle and uh, care for wild animals. So this has that nice beginning and a lot of those things that Alver Alberta Fleming started are things that we're still doing today. And it really helps to build those lifelong connections between animals and nature and all of the people in the world that we live in. So we're going to be um, we're going to be talking a lot about that and some of the ways that we make those connections uh, today. So while I get ready for the um, to bring out and start to that talk, I would like to give a minute just for uh, Tim to talk a little bit about wildlife rehabilitation. And Katie, are you screen sharing our screen? All right, so um, we'll give uh, Betsy just a moment to pull up that screen share. And while she does that, I'll get ready to turn it over to Tim. Do you want preschool connections or what do you um, yeah, which other screen? Which other? Oh, this one? Okay, come in. Okay. Go ahead. All right, so as Christine mentioned, uh, we um, will be speaking about wildlife rehabilitation. So I am the wildlife rehabilitation specialist here and I uh, run the rehab center. So um, we left, 2020 was pretty difficult for everybody, I think. Um, and so last year was very different, but we are now accepting all animal species again. Last year was a little bit different. We're specialized in taking just animals that we specialize in, like waterfowl um, and water birds. Um, but this year, we're actually going to be taking everything now. Um, and so that's a good thing. Not everything, certain things. So always call us if you have an animal that you think might be in need, because 
oftentimes they don't need help, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but um, you know, please call us first. Um, some animals can be dangerous, and you don't want to hurt yourself, and we want to make sure they do need help. So uh, the phone numbers are on there to call our main wildlife line. Uh, we are closed. The center is closed Sundays and Mondays, so we don't have someone at the welcome desk taking phone calls. So that's why we listed our wildlife line number at the top there, um, the 8357 number. That goes right to our wildlife line. We check that very often throughout the day. Um, so if you are, um, you know, you have a question, you call, and we don't answer, just leave a message. We will call you back that same day uh, to make sure that your situation is handled. So, um, and then also the emails on there too. If you wanted to email us a question, uh, we have often we have questions about should I be feeding squirrels or other things like that. So always reach out to us with any questions you have. So. Um, that's pretty much about that. Um, animals are, uh, you know, because of COVID, we're being very careful with this situation. So all animals that we're accepting, we need to have an appointment first. So when you call, we'll direct you to uh, an email that we'll send you with information you have to fill out that you would normally fill out in person. Uh, and that way we can have that information that we need for our permits uh, and that's required. Uh, so that way everything, we keep everybody safe. Um, we have a specific location that you bring the animal to uh, where we can still talk to you about the situation, but, we will, but we'll be distant. So that's, that's a really good thing for you and us. So um, that's how we're handling that. So um, I will uh, put you next to Christine with one of our... Um, yeah, next slide. All right. So um, here at the center, we work on a lot of different animals, but we also interact with a lot of different people. And one of the groups that we see a whole lot of are the preschool students, so the younger aged um, students. This is a time where they're developing the uh, opinions, the attitudes, and uh, their love for animals if they're given those opportunities. So starting students really, really young, uh, getting them a chance to get really close to wildlife, um, giving them a chance to actually touch wildlife uh, and really see it up close is going to be really, really important during their development to help build those bonds. And those bonds are things that can last a lifetime. It's going to help students, uh, for example, a lot of people when they're older are afraid of things like snakes. But if you have a preschooler in the room who hasn't been taught to be afraid of snakes and you get that snake out and they can touch it and they can feel it uh, as they grow up, if they come into contact with a snake or they see a snake, instead of being afraid, uh, trying to run away, trying to sweep the snake out of the room, they'll under have that deeper understanding and appreciation for that animal. And that's really what we're looking for here. And that's one of the things that our animal ambassadors help us to do get those students really close up with the animals and give them a chance to really interact and see those animals up close. So uh, what I have with me today is one of our animal ambassadors. So we're going to switch over so we can take a look. All right, so the animal that I have on my glove right here is one that I'm sure a lot of you will recognize. So this is our gray phase eastern screech owl. And our eastern screech owls um, are a bird that the preschoolers really, really enjoy. They really like. With our larger birds, sometimes the students can get a little bit afraid, a little bit scared. So usually when we start with a class, and we're introducing birds and the idea of having birds up close to you, we'll actually start with a smaller one like this little eastern screech owl. And that way the students can become comfortable with being close to a bird and seeing birds. And then we can move from a little eastern screech owl like this up to larger and larger bird species um, and really get students that connection. It also gives them that chance to look up close as you guys know, when you're trying to find birds or watch birds, they never sit still, right? You're like, oh, I'm about to take that picture. I'm about to get them in my binoculars. And suddenly that's when the bird flies off the branch and is off winging it um, somewhere else. So having a bird on the glove where the students can get really close to it, where you can point out all of the features, things like uh, the little feather tufts and talk about the fact that those aren't his ears. Um, we can talk about his eyes, things like that. In fact, 
if you guys take a close look at this guy, you'll notice, and of course he's not going to let me turn him, uh, you may notice that he has one nice bright eyeball, but on this side, uh-oh, we don't have an eyeball there. So when we're talking about our animal ambassadors, there are certain animals we choose um, to become our ambassadors. We do believe that as a, rehab, a rehabilitation center that wildlife belongs in the wild. So how in the world did we end up with some of our animal ambassadors? And I'm going to turn it over to Tim so he can talk a little bit more about those animals. Let me go back to this. You can just see my head, I think. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. So yes, as she mentioned, um, Almost all, or all of our animals that we have here at the center that we use for education programs um, came into a wildlife rehab program um, or another rehab program with another center um, and can't be released for some reason or another. Um, most of these situations are human related. Um, so the, the owl got hit by a car and, and now has an eye injury and it can't hunt because it's missing an eye. Um, or a par our peregrine has a wing injury where she can't fly anymore because uh, her wing had to be amputated. So, um, all these animals that we that we use here at the that we have here at the center, you know, we use to connect people with wildlife and nature. Um, you know, you can look at books all you want, and those are fun and, and very 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 educational. But it's different. It's definitely different when you actually can see an animal um, up close in person. Um, it just makes it just that much more, in, in, you know, just that much better, uh, where you can actually see a peregrine falcon. Because usually, um, you know, peregrine falcons are way up on the top of buildings or on the top of cliffs or way up in the air where you can't see them. Um, and, you know, here at the center, we can actually show you up close these, these animals. So um, if you're looking at the slide here, on the left there is our female peregrine. She was injured in 2007 as a young bird. So that was her first summer, uh, and she got a wing injury. Um, and it was severely injured where she could not be released back into the wild. It, the, right there where the, the mouse uh, little clicky thing is. Um, you, um, that's where the injury was. Her, her left wing is actually missing. And as Christine said, not all animals are meant for captivity. Um, you have to look at the animal's injury um, or the behavior or even the species to see if they would be do, do well um, in, in, you know, in, in a center. Um, snowy owls wouldn't do well in Texas because they're so, so hot down there and they're, they're you know, used to being up in the Arctic. So um, as, as educa educators, we have to really think about what animal would do best for our programs here and for the animals themselves. Um, the peregrine actually was a bad choice on our part back in the day to keep her because um, peregrines, you know, they're, they're up and they fly and she's grounded because of that wing. So we learned, we actually had to get special permission to keep her from the Division of Wildlife and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services where we have our permits through. Um, but we ended up keeping her and, and, uh, and, you know, so in the future we make better decisions on the animals that we keep for our education programs. She's doing fine. She's happy. She lives with a male, male falcon on, on exhibit now. Um, she used to be off exhibit, actually, um, in, our, in a special room where we kept most of our ed birds, but she's actually outside now where you guys can actually see her and interact, interact with her um, at a distance, of course. Um, on the right there, you'll see our great horned owl. Um, he came in in 2009 as a youngster. You can see his head's kind of fuzzy. Um, and his uh, right eye was uh, injured, um, and it was deemed non-releasable by our vets because of the, the you know, trauma to the eye where he can't see. Um, and that bird came into our rehab program um, when he was just probably trying to leave the nest, and he must have fallen and injured his eye, and that's kind of how things happen. And so he is still um, a wild animal here. I mean, they all, um, they're, they're wild animals. You know, they, they, uh, you know, they don't want to be in captivity, um, obviously, but that's why we choose animals with, the right behavior or the right traits to, to you know, they'll, that they'll do okay here. Um, we had our, one of our uh, oldest owls passed away in 2017, and he was at least 39 years old, so we had him since 1980. So these guys can keep a long time in captivity, and you think of how many people that bird educated, it's, I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of people. So, um, so I'll let uh, you meet one of our other animal ambassadors here in a second. All right, so um, the big, big thing is connecting people with nature, connecting people with nature. That's really what we're all about here. And connecting people with animals here at the center 
can really help extend those connections out into the wild. You see something at the center, you get a chance to see it up close, realize that it's not scary, it's not gross. Um, as you can see, uh, the little girl looking right up close at the opossum. Um, you should never get that close to an opossum. Not a good idea, but here at the center with that piece of glass in between, she can get a really close up look at how the opossum uses its feet, uh, how its nose is constantly moving as it sniffs and smells. Um, so that's really a great close up experience, uh, but with that protection, with that glass there. That way when that student sees an opossum in the wild, they're not afraid of it, they don't want to throw things at it, they're not trying to trap it or scare it away, uh, because opossums and, you know, when they come into class, they get to learn about all of the cool things that opossums do, like eating ticks and helping to keep our environment uh, a little bit cleaner by eating a lot of the things that they find um, in our environment. So having those connections between I saw it at the nature center and, oh, now I understand it, now I'm not afraid of it, and then seeing it in the wild. So that's really the kind of connection and the kind of love uh, that we want to build. We've got students that go home, a possum was my favorite, I got to see it eat. Or maybe they really loved the screech owl because it looked right at them in my eyeballs. Um, so those types of connections, those types of experiences are the things that we want uh, people to keep with them and build with them um, throughout their lives. I have another one of our animal ambassadors here that really does a great job of this um, because this is one of our more common owls in Ohio. And here at uh, Huntington Reservation, we actually have two nesting pairs. Um, so it's a really great chance to see it here at the center and then go straight outside and see it in the wild. So if we can take a close up look, of course we've got our barred owl with us today. And this barred owl, uh, as with our other an animal ambassadors, does have an injury. So you can see on this side, her wing is nice and long, and she's got those nice long wing feathers. But if we turn her around the other direction, on this side, those wing feathers are very, very short, and she's actually missing a portion of her wing. And so with that portion of her wing missing, it makes it very difficult for her to fly. Um, she really can't fly at all. Uh, she can hop around within the enclosure to get to different perches. She can climb up branches, um, but she wouldn't be a good bird to be released into the wild. The great thing about her here is that with barred owls right out on the trail, especially in winter, um, because they're a lot easier to find without all those leaves on the trees, we can show the barred owl in class. Uh, we can take a look at uh, all of its features. Uh, we can give people an idea of exactly how big is this owl. So that's one of the things that's really cool about seeing live animals. You can look at owls in a book, you can look at them online, but seeing pictures doesn't really give you as much of an idea of how big that animal is, um, what the coloration, how its body stands. And so being able to see it live gives you more of that understanding of the shape and the size so that when you go out into the wild looking for the bird or any other animal, you have a better idea of what exactly you're looking for, especially when it comes to owls that like to be right up against those tree trunks, really, really hard to spot. Um, and like I said, with this one that's really cool, you can go to class or go out into our wildlife garden and take a look at the bird, and then you can hike the trail, and you can go and find the owl on the trail. I think the uh, barred owls here in Huntington Reservation are probably the most photographed owls um, in this area because they are so easy to spot in the winter. We know right where their nest is. Um, so it's a really great connection between I saw it in class and then, oh wow, I went and I saw one in the wild. I found it in the tree and it was staring at me the whole time. Having those experiences really helps to, um, to build that connection. So it's not just I went to a class, we saw some animals. It's, I went to a class, we saw that it's some animals, but then I found it in the wild. Um, you know, it wasn't one that was set there or on somebody's glove. So especially as you start uh, talking to older audiences and older children, being able to see it in the wild sometimes is the thing that makes that connection. I found that owl, I know where it's at. Um, and whether they're in a class seeing it or they're out in the wildlife garden seeing it, um, 
that helps to build those connections a little bit more. And so Tim is going to talk a little bit about some of the connections that are built uh, through animals that people actually see up close. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and turn that back over to him in just a moment. So the intake okay. and, and, and uh, the wildlife garden. So as Christine said, um, we're you know we're all about making connections here uh, at, at the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center, and every situation is different. Any every animal is different, um, and every uh, just situation is different. Really, um, this peregrine falcon um, on the slide here. Um, are the slides up? Yep. Okay. So um, that bird is nicknamed Spencer. He was actually a, a bird that nested um, near East Ninth in Cleveland. He was named that by the Division of Wildlife and Chris and Chad Saladin that um, if you know anything about peregrines, you know those two <laughs> fantastic people. Um, you can see in that photo there that he's got a plastic cup and uh, paper, or not paper, string wrapped around his feet. So what happened, I found out the story with this, and he was grounded uh, on the ground. He couldn't fly because all that was wrapped around his feet and he couldn't stand. Um, I found out that there was a school somewhere in Cleveland that did a memorial thing with uh, one of their students or something where they would release a balloon with a note in this cup and uh, would tie to the string, and they would release these balloons into the, into the air to send this message out. Um, and these are the, one of the toughest things, I think, uh, in our, our position as educators is to how do you tell someone that, you know, when they have a family member that passed, don't do what you're doing. Um, it's very, very tricky. I've tried it many times, and it can be very tricky. You have to, it's very delicate how you handle that situation. But they don't realize that, you know, even though it looks pretty as that balloon's floating up to the sky, it's no different whatsoever if you had that balloon deflated and threw that on the ground. Same exact thing, except one way is prettier than the other. Um, and so what happened was, we think, this balloon was flying in the air and the peregrine didn't want it in his territory and he grabbed it to knock it out of the air and he got wrapped around his feet and then he fell to the ground and was in rehab for about a week to get his weight back up because he couldn't feed because of that. So, um, you know, we want people to, you know, you know, support their loved ones in situations like that, uh, but definitely think about different ways to do that um, instead of, uh, you know, doing balloon releases like that. Uh, maybe release, you know, native monarch butterflies or something, or something that's that's natural, that's 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 native, that you can still get that message out, but in a, in a natural, safe way for our environment. Um, and so that's just one of the million stories we have that in, in animals that are brought into the center is they're affected by us. Um, we may not think about it um, in that way, but you know, there's two kind of two sides to it where we we, we see that on you know, when the bird was brought in here, but the people did that, they wouldn't want that bird wrapped in the wire um, and on the ground like that, but they, didn't, they don't know the consequences because they, they never thought that was an option. And so that's one of our main things is we're educating on is that um, don't do this or don't do that in a nice way um, because they can really affect many things in our environment. So um, in rehab, um, you, the public is not allowed to see our animals. It's, it's, it's according to our permits that you can't, actually come in and see their animals. Many people ask when they bring an animal here, you know, can we come see our animal? And uh, unfortunately, the, re the answer is no for that. And there's many reasons why. Um, you know, these animals are wild and wildlife rehabbers really, you know, make the goal to make these animals, you know, afraid of us. Uh, they, they don't, we don't want them to see us. We don't want to stress them out because they want to be in the wild. They don't want to be in captivity. And so we're just kind of in the, you know, helping them to get back into the wild. Like Christine had mentioned earlier, um, all the animals we have here are not releasable for one way or another. Our goal is to get them back out there to release them uh, in, a, in a capable way where they can breed and do everything else you need to do as that species. So you wouldn't release a duck with one foot uh, or you wouldn't release a hawk with one eye typically. Um, and that's because they wouldn't do well in the wild, you know, with those injuries. So that's why we have those. The barnel actually that Christine just had out uh, was uh, wrapped in wire that was covered over a koi pond to prevent the animals from eating the koi. And, and bar dolls will actually eat fish and frogs and other things like that. Well, she got her leg fractured and her wing fractured in two places because of the wire. Um, and so the people didn't know they were doing that. But then once we educated them on, 
you know, unfortunately, this is what happened. They're like, I never thought that would happen. And so um, many things are, most of the, almost all the animals we get in are human-related or another, uh, and whether it's, a, you know, negligence on purpose or they just didn't know. And so that's why we're here to, to help that, you know, help people understand and, and make that connection. We're like, man, I'm never going to litter again or I'm never going to do that again. You know, we make that connection because it's, it's important that we get that message out there. Um, and as I mentioned, um, where you can't, the public can't see our rehab animals, uh, two years ago we actually made an enclosure. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an exhibit, basically, where we can actually have wildlife in a, a pre-release cage, the enclosure there, um, where the public can actually look in through those windows and see what animals are in there. And so they might be able to see the animal they brought in, uh, depending. It's got one-way glass. So according to our permits, you know, the public is not allowed to see, the animals are not allowed to see the public and vice versa. So we actually designed this where it's a one-way glass situation where the public can look in and see the animal, but the animal can't see the public. So that's a really good way for, for, for them to be able to look in and see what rehabilitation is because all of it, most of it's off, all of it's off, off, you know, off the, the scenes. Uh, you know, and so this is a good way for, for us to educate specifically about window strikes because um, there's windows, and so whenever you have a window, you have window strikes typically that actually has um, a window, prevention, or window strike prevention on the front of the glass and on the outside of the glass too because the birds on the inside, we don't want them to hit the window, and the birds on the outside, same thing, so we can, they can see the little dots, the little fitted dots on the windows, and they can, you know, they can learn with the signs right there what, what that dot does and what they're there for and, and how you can do that at your own home. So it's, it's, a, it's a really good way to be able to see. Um, and with rehabbers, we don't um, keep specific enclosures for one species. That would be too tough because we treat over 160 species a year potentially. So we could have an eagle in there, or we could have a possum in there, or we could have, uh, you know, a, a mink or something. So it's, it's really, it's, it works really well to, to do that. So I think that's an awesome addition that, um, as far as I know, no other center has. So it's a, it's a really cool way to do that. So um, I will, uh, switched over to Christine so she could show you another cool animal. All right. So what you're going to see um, in both of these slides are students that are actually handling the animals. So in this, um, we have one of our students handling the red-tailed hawk. Uh, in order to get to that level of handling, you have to put in lots and lots of time, lots and lots of hours in order to get to that point. So we're going to start off with the smaller, easier to handle birds, um, and then work the students up to that point. So one of the ways that we're connecting with our high schoolers is giving them that chance to get close to something that is this cool, that's this amazing. So not only are they seeing it in a classroom, not only are they looking at it through the exhibit, but they're actually learning how to approach that bird without any barriers and how to handle that bird without somebody else holding it for them. So that's true whether we're talking about birds or whether we're talking about uh, skunks or rabbits, uh, that experience of being able to pick up and handle and learn how to be the one that's in charge of these animals. They're in here cleaning the animals. They even get a chance, and Tim will talk about it later, to uh, go into a rehab area uh, with the wild animals as well as these really well-trained um, animal ambassadors. On the second slide, you can see one of our students is actually handling the uh, screech owl. And so beyond just learning how to properly hold and handle the animals, another thing that helps to build that connection is allowing the students to share their knowledge. So you love something, you learn about it, you really build that passion, and with the students it really comes through when they're talking to other people. So beyond just learning how to hold and handle the animals, they're learning their natural history, they're learning a lot about um, their specific features of each animal, and they're starting to learn how to share that with the public. And so you can really tell what the students are interested in if you listen to them when they're talking to somebody else, um, when they're talking to adults or talking to other children um, or even going to a preschool class and helping with things like summer camps. You can really get a good feeling for what that student is interested in um, and what really makes them tick and what they really want to learn. And it helps to, again, strengthen those connections because now not only does the student love the animal, 
but as they continue in their life into their future, um, into their careers, they can uh, share that knowledge. They've learned how to talk about these animals. They've learned uh, how to communicate well and use those communication skills, whether they're talking to adults or whether they're talking to children. And this is something that uh, I know that birders are really, really good at. Um, I've seen, you know, my grandpa would take me out into the forest and he showed me how to use the binoculars. I know I was not using them pro properly as a child because I always kept closing my eyes, but just that connection, and this is something that I'm doing and grandpa's showing me and I could point out the birds for him. So uh, you guys as birders are helping, you know, when you share those experiences uh, with uh, your friends, with your children, um, it's really helping to build that experience and build that love. And I think that's why the birding community is so cool um, and there's so many people that love to bird is because they share that experience of helping to figure out where in the tree that bird is or what bird am I hearing. So it's just a really, really great opportunity um, and we're using that same opportunity to share your knowledge to help and build that love uh, for the animals and that confidence in our students to be able to share all of that knowledge. Um, which is really, really, really cool. Um, speaking of uh, talking a little bit about birds, I have that, that red-tailed hawk who is so beautiful. She's such a great education bird. Um, I decided that since you got to see her in the photo, uh, that you might like to see her live on video. So she is an amazing, beautiful bird. Uh, with this bird, it makes a huge impact whether you're with students or whether you're with adults She's so large, um, especially if she chooses to open her wings like we saw in the picture. It just is a wow moment when she comes out of her, her carrier, comes out of her crate. She's so big and she just has such a huge presence in the room that it really just draws people in. And she's a type of bird that you're driving down the highway, you see them sitting up on a sign. A lot of people, when she comes out, they're like, whoa, I didn't realize how big that bird is because she's usually sitting up high and you're driving past her fast uh, on the highway. So it really helps to get that wow factor. When you get that wow, that's usually something that people are going to remember. So being able to have such a big, beautiful bird like this really helps, uh, really helps to build that connection. The other thing that's kind of fun and cool is everybody hears red tail hawk, red tail hawk. Um, uh, when I talk to uh, preschoolers, so we've got the, the older students that like handling. Um, when I talk to preschoolers, I usually will turn them around and say, well, what color is her tail? And of course, the answer I get from the younger students is brown. They always say it's a brown, it's a brown tail hawk. So when we talk about bricks and what color are bricks and get to the point that when you say that something's red, like a red tailed or a red shouldered, you might not mean apple red like a cardinal. You might mean a uh, brick red like the red tail hawk um, which is really pretty cool. Now I'm going to see if I can get her face up close to the camera. This eye that's closer to me uh, is the one that has the injury, so you really can't see it. And we'll see how close she'll let me get. I'm just watching her body language there. And she may not, she may not see you. Whoop. She says, no, nope, I don't think so. There we go. All right. Um, but she does have an injury in that eye. Uh, which is the reason why we have her here. So as a hawk, she needs to be able to look the length of a football field and be able to find her prey on the ground. They really, really rely on their sight, and they really rely on having two eyes for that binocular vision. That gives you your depth perception. So only being able to see out of one eye um, really limits her ability to determine how far or close that prey item is, and you really need that depth perception if you're going to swoop down and grab a shrew or a vole out of the ground. So once again, very, very cool animal, helps us to build even stronger connections with not just the preschoolers or the younger students, but also our high schoolers and those adults that go, wow, um, you really want something to shock them, to uh, inspire them, to help remember seeing that bird and build those uh, bigger, deeper connections, which is really, really cool. As I mentioned, they get to work on, our, our students get to work on handling and teaching 
but they also get to go a little bit deeper into what's going on when an animal gets injured. And so we're going to let Tim talk a little bit more about the way that we share uh, information about how and why we do rehab with our students. This is pretty cool. All right, as Christine said, um, you know, the Project Wildlife Students is the program that Christine runs. Um, and these are high school students um, that, that are here to learn and, and, and do all kinds of amazing things that most people don't get the chance to do. Um, and then those high school, high school uh, wild, Project Wildlife students actually get to help in rehab um, when, when they, you know, they graduate through all of their, the, their, uh, their courses that they do here. Um, they, that's one of the last things for the summer that they get to do is they get to spend a day in rehab once a week and to be able to help us in our, in our rehab program. So, uh, you know, they, they, it's, it's, rehab is not an easy thing. There's a lot of work. It's very busy. It's crazy. It's messy. It's dirty. Um, and you run around and doing 15 things at one time. And so um, as, as the students start when they're, with their first year here, um, Christine's program is just incredible, and they, do, they learn so many cool things. Um, and, you know, every year they get more and more older and more mature, and they could, you know, do more responsibilities. And so that being able to do rehab is the last thing that they get to do before they graduate, and that's a huge thing for them. So you can see in the bottom left corner, uh, the, the bottom slide, rather, left slide, is Alyssa and Will, and uh, those were students in two, two, they graduated until 19, I think. Um, and so they are um, on their own um, force feeding a, it looks like a red shoulder hawk there that was in rehab. And um, that's a huge thing. I mean, that's something that most people don't get to do to be able to uh, hold a hawk and, and give it fluids or give it meds or, you know, help do a wing wrap or do things like that. That's something that they, most people don't get to do. So, you know, can you imagine the, 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 the impact that has on their life when they get to do something cool like that? Um, you know, same, it's just amazing. So, um, and another thing we do here at Lake Erie Nature and Science Center is we have an awesome uh, wildlife intern program. Um, last year we didn't have it, of course, because of what was going on, but this year we plan to go ahead and do our internship program. So, um, if you're a college student and you're, you're, you're studying biology or zoology or, you know, veterinary uh, things like that, you can apply, um, and we're accepting applications until March 31st. You just go to our website and, and get the link there, and I think Betsy could probably put that up there too um, for, for that. Um, and on that bottom right uh, slide there, you can see Kyle and Kirsten. Um, both of those, uh, those people were interns at one point, and then they became staff here. So um, it's just an incredible where you can kind of move up in your life and, and do that. Kirsten actually left us recently to go to vet school. So luckily I told her we get free vets, uh, vet care when she comes back uh, after she's a veterinarian. So... <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Um, and Kyle's still, still a worker here today, and he's holding a goose in, this, in this, this photo, and he actually just admitted a goose about half an hour ago. So it's, it's really, you know, that's awesome that you could, you know, be an intern here, um, learn all the cool things that we get to do in a rehab summer, um, and then apply that to your life in the future. Um, you know, sometimes, a lot of times, rehab's not for everybody. It's, you know, there is a lot of death, unfortunately, and it's not as gloomy as you see those things on Facebook where there's, you know, um, I'm this person and my mom thinks I do this and my friends think I do this. You know, rehab's not always fun, but, you know, it, it is part of the job. And, um, you know, we, you know, we do get to release many animals and um, we're very proud of that, but not all of them, unfortunately, are able to do that. So um, that's, you know, they get really exposed to that and learn this may be for me or this may not be for me. You know, it, it, every, every person's different and their passions are different. So, but this is what this program is so amazing for is because that builds that, you know, that, that confidence in, in those students and in those kids and uh, really can teach them, you know, is this for me or is this not for me? Um, I know one, one of our interns in 2019 uh, didn't really care for waterfowl, and that's what we specialize in here, waterfowl. And then after she left, she, she loves waterfowl. That's her favorite thing. And she's applying for a new internship position this year at a, wild, at a, at a seabird sanctuary in Alaska. Um, and so, you know, that's just huge that, you know, we, we, you know, we developed that with that, with that person. And now they're, you know, they're, they're going more, more forward in other, other areas of their life to continue that passion. So that's huge. Um, it's just, it's so cool. We you know, deal with so many different things through injured animals. Um, you know, we're feeding baby animals, um, you know, and it's, it's just, every animal is different. So, you know, you might have a squirrel that is very, very nasty and, and mean, um, but you might have a, a morning dove that's very calm and, and, you know, is not really scared of people. So, Every animal is different, um, every species is different, and, you know, we have to know how to care for all those species in one day. So we can get 
two geese in, a hummingbird and an eagle, and we have to know how to care for, feed, set up and, and with their enclosure, all those different animals. And so that really teaches these students, you know, how, how we do that. You know, you don't want to give a hummingbird a bowl of nectar to drink, to drink out of because it could fall in, get hypothermic, and it could kill it. So there's many things that you learn in this, in this field that you would never think about. Um, it's, just, it's really, really awesome that we can, that we can you know, teach these, these young kids and these young, young humans you know, what, what we can do in the future to, to help wildlife uh, and just you know, continue their passion throughout their lives. It's just so cool. So um, it's just it's awesome. We'll go to the next slide. Me, you want to do it now? All right. So um, as you heard, we love connecting with people. We love teaching people, whether it's people who end up staying at the center and uh, working with us, whether it's volunteering or as a staff member, or whether it's those folks that are heading out uh, to do something a little bit different. Uh, we had one of our interns actually base her um, master's uh, thesis on one of our animals and use that as part of her coursework. And now, in just a few months, she's going to be graduating from veterinary school. So building those connections is really what's at the core of uh, what we do here and part of our mission to really connect everyone with uh, nature and the wild animals and wildlife right in your very own backyard. We would love to make that connection uh, with you even more than we did in our program today. We'd love to see you up here at the center. Um, so please come and visit us. We do have free admission, um, but it is by appointment. So we're trying to uh, make sure that, um, that we keep the number of people in the building at one time uh, down a little bit lower, uh, but still offer that free admission and give you that chance to come in and see that opossum or go outside and see the peregrines and help to make that connection. Or maybe you're really interested in photographing those barn owls that are out on uh, the trail behind the building. So we definitely encourage you to uh, hop online, make a reservation. Like I said, it is free. And then you can come right up to the center at your time, check out all the animals here. And after your reservation, you can go out into Huntington Reservation and find the birds, the owls, and the other animals that are living right here um, on the Cleveland Metro Parks property and it just matches. We're so lucky to be out here in Huntington Reservation because it really matches our mission and what we're trying to do and the ways that we try to connect um, with people uh, together with nature. And uh, we're really excited to have talked to you guys today and really hope to see you here at the center and maybe even see you again next week um, where we're going to be talking a little bit more about rehab and we're going to actually follow a couple of cases and take a closer look at um, some of the items and things that uh, animals may have gotten trapped in in the past. Well, thank you, Christine and Tim. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christine Barnett and Tim Jasinski uh, from Lake Erie Nature and Science Center. I want to just take a moment before we close to um, go over the, all the programs that we're going to be co-hosting this month. Today, as we see at the, on the slide, number one, February 1st, Making Lifelong Connections with Wildlife. What a lovely program. Thank you. We hope you'll join us for next week, next Monday, uh, February 8th, Trashy Situations, How Waste Affects Wildlife. Then the following Monday, the perils of bird life and how you can help. And then the fourth Monday in February, baby season, does baby wildlife really need our help? So uh, you can learn much more about all of these programs uh, online and also going to visit wcaudubon.org, wcaudubon.org, the website. Go to the home page and you'll see a navigational button, uh, Wildlife Programs. Click on that and it'll take you to the, this information. I just love the slide that's up right now. 
look at all of these happy people. These, this happens to be a birding community here on the near west side and other parts of Cleveland who have come together and they are going to go be going out or went out on a bird walk, uh, probably led by Tim Jasinski uh, at Huntington Reservation, the uh, Cleveland Metro Parks Park that is immediately adjacent to the center. What a resource. Uh, here again, I want to show you in case you didn't get to see in the beginning, take a look at these lovely photos. On the left, the beautiful center. This is the lovely center on the left in springtime, it happens to be. And then the two other programs or photos show uh, young wildlife uh, interns and uh, all the things that they're doing to learn and uh, learn about animals and animal care. So in my closing, I'd like to ask you to please consider making a generous donation to this wonderful center. Uh, you know, wildlife rehabilitation specialists are some of today's unsung heroes and heroines. They're now working under tremendous pressure and they continue regardless to aid and assist injured wildlife despite the crippling effects of climate change that are, is now compounded by the social and economic complications of this new and challenging COVID-19 era. So please consider making a donation. And here on the slide that you see, I've listed out several ways for you to do that. One, the information is about the center, that it's a 501c3 organization, it's tax ID, and the link of where you can go to the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center website and make a direct donation. You can go, uh, another place that you can go is go and follow and go to the donate button at the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center Facebook page. And you'll see there are clear instructions there for where to donate and how to help support this entity online. If you want to send a check, here's the address. Send the check to Lake Erie Nature and Science Center, Attention Wildlife Rehabilitation Staff, 28728 Wolf Road, Bay Village, Ohio, and that's on the near west side of the greater Cleveland, Ohio, U.S. metropolitan area. And finally, if you would like to learn more about the center and read our article that talks about why and how you can make a donation to support these local community services here on the near west side, uh, you can go to the the uh, Make a Donation to Lake Erie Nature and Science Wildlife Rehabilitation Center, this article and the link to it. Now, of course, if you live in another part of the world, please do go and look for your closest wildlife rehabilitation center so that you can uh, support them, learn more about the important work that they do to help bridge uh, the connections and bridge uh, the uh, interactions that can happen between our wildlife and the human populations, whether it's in an urban setting or uh, a rural setting. So I'd like to close the, uh, with, again, thank you to Christine and Tim for this wonderful uh, program today. And here they are once again, our wildlife rehabilitation hero and heroine. Here's our, our programs, how to make a donation, and thank you so much for attending today. We hope we see you again uh, very soon.